Romans chapter 8, we left off in verse 25, but if <clears throat> we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait with perseverance. And we learned that we have perseverance because we have hope. We have hope because we have the Holy Spirit in us. And we have the Holy Spirit because Christ died for us. Um, the Holy Spirit that is mentioned here now over 20 times in one chapter, while previously only mentioned a couple times from chapters 1 through uh, 7, the emphasis is the Spirit because the Spirit is the down payment, as it were, um, of the hope that we have. In other words, we wonder about all the promises given to us, and oftentimes our wonder comes with doubt because of pain that we experience. We experience pain. It is difficult, and I believe unwise, of many pastors to belittle the pain that we are going through today in free countries, but it is important to mention that the pain that is happening here with these Christians in the early church is a little more severe than a lot of the pain that we have gone through personally in this room and in free countries today. The pain they are going through is families being ripped apart for the sole purpose of being Christians. Um, children being slaughtered if parents don't renounce Jesus Christ, being put into the Colosseum, even in Rome, to be ripped apart by animals like lions. And this is the kind of suffering that they're going through. Now, we don't want to belittle our pain, but the reason for bringing both of, both of these types of pain up is that if they can overcome their pain that they're going through with the promises given to them through the doctrine given to them and us in the book of Romans, then how much more us who have not gone through the depths of pain that they have gone through when Paul is writing to these Christians. Now, we have gone through terrible things and we can say, God, where are you? Where are you in this? And I want to believe what your word says, but what is the evidence that all the promises you're giving us will come to pass? What is the evidence that you'll return for your church? What is the proof that we can trust that we will one day have a new heaven and a new earth? What, can we, uh, what kind of evidence can you give to prove that one day we'll receive new bodies and new names, uh, that one day we won't have to battle sin, and one day we will have an eternal resting place in the presence of God and in heaven. What is the proof of all this? Because right now, we're doubting, and people have a tendency to doubt. We all do. Well, it's the Spirit of God. You remember... <clears throat> After that moral conscious, as a non-believer, was conflicted, when you started to become aware of the sins you were committing, and I've shared examples of personal experience to try to illustrate humanity itself. We all have a moral conscious, as Romans 1 teaches us, and we have violated that sometime usually when we're young and we, we hit that age of accountability. And we start to become aware that the wickedness of this world is wrong and the wickedness in our hearts are wrong. And then over time, as we continue in that wickedness, our moral consciousness is seared with a hot iron and we no longer have a, um, a consciousness of sin to the degree that the Bible has explained. And, and, and when that happened... You become closed off. You just go on sinning. It's not a big deal. You're an unbeliever. You don't have the consciousness of, of it anymore as it had been hardened. But when you get born again, the Holy Spirit comes. You start to change. Your mind changes. All of a sudden, 
You didn't want to go to church, and now you want to go to church. You never sang the songs, and now you sing the songs. Um, you have different spiritual appetites. You have different desires. The other ones don't necessarily go away. They're just accompanied with righteous ones. That is the proof of the Holy Spirit being in you. And because we can rely on this proof that gives the, us the ability to trust in the rest of Scripture, with many other proofs, this is just the most intimate one, we have hope. And because of this hope, we ought to, should persevere, we have the ability to persevere as Christians where the world has no meaning. Without eternity and hope in that eternity in Christ, there's no meaning in life. No eternal meaning. So we pick up in this context in verse 26 as it goes on talking about the Spirit. The Bible says, likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose, for whom he foreknew he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren, moreover whom he predestined, these he also called, and whom he called, these he also justified, and whom he justified, these he also glorified. So, there is a port, th this chapter is immensely encouraging for Christians. The Bible says that all scripture is God breathed and good for rebuke and correction and uh, training in righteousness, that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped into every good work. There is a deep danger that lies within churches that do not cover all of scripture, that do not do exposition. That's why one of our scriptures that we have up uh, permanently here is um, regarding exposition. This is a distinctive of our church. Paul charges Timothy, therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom, Preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. Um, it, it, the idea there is go through scripture. Okay? And, and we accompanied with that in Isaiah 28 for precept must be upon precept, precept must be upon precept, line upon line, line upon line. Here a little and there a little. That's a prophet where people are not listening to what he says the first time. So he repeats it. That's how important it is. We are to go through all the scripture. Acts 20, the blood of men is not on my hands, the apostle Paul would say, um, because I have not shunned to teach you the whole counsel of God. What ends up happening when the pastors of churches get to pick what they teach is they will pick the things they are prone to being interested in, and even worse, they will pick the things that the church is failing at. This will happen to all, all men. No one is exempt. I remember years ago, I had studied immensely. I'm talking dozens of books and multiple hours and hundreds, thousands of hours. And the Word of Faith movement, the history of it, the formalization of it with Finnis Quimby and on and on the list goes. 
And I could, t- even though I was even doing exposition, I could turn every sermon into rebuking the word of faith, prosperity gospel. Um, one day, my faithful wife, after a Sunday service, told me, she says, we get it, the prosperity gospel is evil, can we get on with the Bible? She rebuked me, it stung, but I received it. In Roman, and, and, and in Romans here, we get this immense encouragement. And if it was for the first seven chapters of Romans, we could have been left a people in great despair, depression, anxiety, but we get the rest of the book. A a mistake that these people make, pastors, and we're all prone to it, is constantly rebuking their people. There's not enough volunteers, you know. And, uh, and I realized many, many years ago that if you want to continue to rebuke your people without encouragement, you will leave your people very discouraged all the time. And I've noticed it in my travels all around the world um, at churches preaching. I've noticed it in <laughs> even some of my friends. It's like there's always... You're not doing this, and 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 you're not doing this. And um, it can leave our people very discouraged. Uh, you know, people can try to solicit volunteers. We volunteers. We don't have enough children, this and that. And I, I realize that if that happens all the time, we're going to have a legalistic church. We've got to be very careful of that. Now, of course... Uh, People should help at their churches and all those different things. But guys, some of you are working six days a week, 10 hours a day, and you don't need to be in church like I am eight hours on Sunday. We have three services. You can come and attend one, and then you go spend the rest of the Sunday with your families. Um, and, and, And so... The point is, the Bible creates a holistic Christian, and it produces a holistic church, where people are filled with joy, because yes, they get rebuked at times by scriptures when rebukes come, and they get encouraged by scriptures when the encouragement comes. Romans 8 is a deep encouragement, and and. and you think about the discouragement of Romans 1. Now, we need it bad. The truth is we need it. Because it says that they are rejecting the evidence of creation, especially the evidence of creation, the creation of humanity. And the moral conscious within, being in his image, and instead of behaving like a people who have a moral conscious because we're created in the image of God, They are behaving like animals, men with men in homosexuality, women with women in lesbianism, violence. And the the Romans one talks about they are brute beast. The world has become a lot of just brute beasts. People with have it it uses the word debased, animal-like behaviors. They have humanity has come so low, and God intended so much more for them. And because of this, God has every right to kill them and judge them eternally. Romans 1 teaches us that. It goes on speaking again, not not just the Jews' religion, Judaism, but speaking against Gentiles, pagan religions, and Jews' religions, and that these religions that exalt themselves to a place where they can be right with God based on their own good works, God will crush them down in judgment because it is an offense to God to think anybody can earn their salvation. They cannot. And you kind of go through this, and this truths, as many truths are very hard to deal with, questions emerge. They arise. Well, what hope do we have? Well, 
Even while we were yet sinners in Romans 5, Christ died for us. Okay, well, golly, well, what does that mean for sanctification? Does that mean we just sin and Christ's sacrifice just covers all of it and we can just enjoy some pleasure? Well, no, it doesn't mean that. We cover that and we're getting through all this and there's still doubts. And Paul is now on this encouraging and he says, the spirit helps us in our weakness. The spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the heart knows the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. This is this encouragement. So much doubt, and rightly so, has come into the minds of the hearts of the people who are hearing this letter from the Apostle Paul. Weakness, without strength, inability, you need grace by faith, and all, all this different stuff. And, and, and now, this realization comes that you cannot earn anything with God in terms of righteousness into heaven and reconciliation through good works and you can't do that and so the spotlight as it were the the light and, and please follow me on this guys has shined in our hearts exposing the darkness for each and every one of us that's what Romans has done <laughs> contrary to as we discussed yesterday talking about Darwinian evolution, contrary to the idea that we are evolving into this greater species, which is a lie. True anthropology, the study of man, has given to us properly in the book of Romans that we are desperately wicked, that there is none good, no, not one, that there was a fall in humanity, the, the God subjected humanity, but not willingly, but subjected in hope. He wasn't willing that man fell, but we did, and we are born sinners, and that's the reality of who we are, and this, this, this light of truth has shined in our minds and shown the corruption of it down into our hearts and, and shown the wickedness within, and, and that can be discouraging for us. And we're like, wow, well, God can't love me because our minds are so driven by reward and earning and reward and earning and reward and earning. If I do good, I am rewarded. If I do bad, I am punished. And we have to live in a system like this to a certain degree, judicially, with par parental authority, we got to be careful as parents, don't we? You do good, you're rewarded. You do bad, you're punished. And because I've understood this kind of concept and, and the, the, f the finite minds and hearts that we have and the, the, the pride that drives us to this idea that this is how God treats us, that I even when my kids do something wrong, I've, had, I've been known to have a habit because... I believe in spanking properly on not the back, but the, the, the butt because God gave us butts for spanking. That's why there's more cushion back there. You guys have no idea how much I refrain from saying. But the Lord is working in my life. And I've brought my children in the room to spank them and say, you know, you rebelled. You did what you were, weren't supposed to do. I told you not to, you did it anyways, and you lied about it, something, you know. And because of this concept, now I don't do this all the time, but <laughs> I'd be like, you know, you deserve a spanking. You deserve to be punished. But this time I'm going to show you grace. Do you know what grace is? That means I don't get to spank it. Yeah, that's, that's what grace is to the kids right now. 
do you, and then I won't do it, and then I can take them out and give them ice cream. See, that's, that, that's grace. Mercy is uh, not getting what you deserve. Grace is getting what you do not deserve. We get rewarded. And I'll take them out and get them ice cream. One time, I was in town, in a, and I got smashed. You know, I've, been re- I've had so many road accidents, but I got smashed by a car. I get out, and I'm talking to this guy, and I immediately know he's a Muslim. And this guy has money. He's damaged the car. It was his fault. He smashed right in the back of me. And I'm like, this is an evangelical moment, you know. <laughs> and so I'm like, you know, you deserve to pay this. You know what that, you, you owe me money. And, I, and he's like, how much? I'm like, a minimum of 10000 He's like, please, please, let me give you five. I'm like, okay, I'll take 5000 He goes, can I pay you tomorrow? <laughs> yeah, right. And I, I say, you know what? Mercy is, is not getting what you deserve. You deserve to pay me that money but I'm not going to make you pay me because I'm going to show you mercy. And he's like, thank you. And I said, but grace is getting rewarded for something you have not earned. And I pulled, <laughs> I think it was like 3,000 shillings out of my pocket and I handed it to him. I said, that's grace. And that's what Jesus Christ has done on the cross. This guy took the money, laughed at my face, got in a car and drove off. I thought this powerful moment had opened by the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Golly, preconceived. I thought we were going to have this God moment. I know what you want me to do, God. And we are so prone to this, ladies and gentlemen. We're so prone to, I need to be punished. We must understand that Christ was punished on the cross for our sins. He was punished. And we must stop looking to us being punished all the time because we have sinned or missed the mark or fail. And, and, and Paul is encouraging us, trying to get us to see the truth in the midst of all these world religions that try to earn their way, in the midst of a deep desire within humanity to earn their way and to have this idea of reward and punishment, reward and punishment. Yes, people should be punished. But God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And, and we've already covered that we, that doesn't mean we continue in sin, but that's a, another context. Right now he's encouraging, he says, we understand your weaknesses. The triune Godhead, we understand your weakness. And the Spirit, the Holy Spirit is going to help you in this. Even we do not know what we ought to pray. But the Spirit himself makes intercession with us with groanings which cannot be uttered. There are two different interpretations. Some believe this is the prayer language of tongues, personal prayer language, I definitely would say that's a possibility because I know that um, there is a prayer language uh, of tongues. Here in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, it says in verse 2, For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to God, for no one understands him. However, his spirit, in his spirit he speaks mysteries. We groan and, at, uh, and we have the gift of tongues given to individuals in their prayer closets. I don't want to go into the whole thing of the day of Pentecost. Um, We went through that in the book of Acts. You can refer to the website to, to see that. But it is possible that this is speaking of speaking in tongues privately and personally in a prayer language to the Lord um, when you run out of things to, to, to say. Um, the other view is that the Holy Spirit being one with us, inside of us, intimately becoming one, as we pray, 
he is interceding on our behalf according to the will of God. I, um, I've done this many times, and maybe some of you have done it. You're like, you set aside an hour for prayer. Anybody ever set aside 30 minutes or an hour for, uh, for prayer? A real dedicated time for prayer in your room. No one's around. You even get on your knees and you're like, I'm going for it. I'm going an hour. And you get down and you start praying and you're like, wow, I think I'm done. And you look at your clock and you're like, that was three minutes. <laughs> We've done that, haven't we? Because of this portion of scripture, I have realized that I can get on my knees and begin to groan. And I'm not necessarily talking about some audible sound. Sometimes I do. But groan in my spirit is like, Lord, I don't know what, I, I don't know what to say. I've said all I can think. Holy Spirit, speak. Intercede on my behalf. I know I need to be on my knees right now. I know I need to be alone, no cell phone, no, no notifications, dinging in the background. Guys, don't do that when you're praying. <laughs> you have your phone and you're praying, and a ding, you're like, Holy Spirit, can you wait one moment? <laughs> don't do that. If you've not experienced the strength you can receive from doing this, you, you must start now. You go in your room and you go, I'm not saying don't use words. There's plenty of time in, in prayer where we need to use words. But that time where you're just groaning, oh God, I don't know what to say. My mind is empty. It's finite. I can't think of the words. But I'm, I'm hurting. I'm weak. I'm in pain. I'm lonely. I don't know what to do. And the spirit begins to translate those groanings which cannot be uttered according to the languages we know. And he, those, from, from that groanings to the throne room with the Father has translated into a heavenly language that God the Father knows. And he's praying. That is... Um, what's happening here, I believe. And with this understanding, I encourage you, church, to do this. Do this prayer. Also, I believe that the Holy Spirit is interceding on our behalf, changing our prayers. We get on our knees. We don't know the will of God because a lot of us are praying our own personal desires. We get on our knees like, Lord, you know what would be really good for my family? A 2023 Land Cruiser Prado. That would be good for my family. You know that I ha we have, we have, the kids are going to three different schools. The Matatus, Lord, after 878 years, the Prado would pay for itself because of the Matatu cost. We start doing that, and the Holy Spirit intercedes on our behalf and says, Lord, don't give him a Prado, give him a Peaky Peaky. <laughs> because he knows what we need, and we don't, oftentimes. He is interceding for us, because he knows the will of God. And guys, you have to understand something that's going on here, what the scripture is talking about. We have to get this. We're one with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's intercession for us is our prayers to God because we are one. We are so one with the Holy Spirit for those of us who are born again, though we're not always listening to the Holy Spirit's voice, we should be. That the Apostle Paul writing to the Corinthian church said, when you go into a prostitute, you were taking the Holy Spirit to be joined to a prostitute. That's how one and intimate we really are with 
the Holy Spirit. We have become one with him. He is in us. We are in him. And when we pray, it's, it, it, the intercession of the Holy Spirit is, hey, I'm bringing Josh's prayers to you. I've corrected them a little bit because they're off. Don't give him the Prado. Give him a peeky peeky or you know, whatever the case. And you know, I believe one of the greatest reasons, if not the greatest, that we're not hearing the voice of the Holy Spirit guiding us and leading us through our lives is because we are so consumed with our own personal will. Look at it. It says, he makes intercession for the saints according to what? The will of God. Not your will. Not my will. Now, when your will becomes God's will and the Holy Spirit's will, then he'll answer your prayer with yes. Until then, it's no or wait. Wait till you're in line. And, and, and I must say this because it's so prevalent. And I, I, formal university education is an idol in this country. Now, I do want to clarify something. I am not against formal university education. I want my doctors to be formally educated. I don't want them performing surgery on me, surgery on me without education <laughs> or nurses. People need to go to school for reasons. But to think that 100% of all God's people, of all humanity is called to more university or formal education is inaccurate. It's wrong. And, 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 I, and the reason why I have to speak about this all the time is because you guys would be shocked how many times a week. And honestly, the Lord has given me strength to be gracious in it because I could get impatient quickly with how many people come is like the Lord's not answering my prayers. And I'm like, let me guess, school fees? And if I say that, I'm right 90% of the time. God is still God and still hears your prayers if he doesn't give you the exact university that you want to go to. Don't doubt God's ability to hear and God's ability to answer. Doubt your ability to ask the right questions and to desire the right things. That is what we should be doubting. Because I understand and I'm sympath sympathetic. It's, he's, God is not with me. That's what I hear all the time. God is not with me. God is not answering me. And I'm thinking, no, God, he is with you. He is answering you. You just may not be with him. You, you may not be following him. You may not know the will that he has specifically for your life. And you need to listen. And you need to adjust your will. So he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. I implore you, I encourage you, please. Please, pray this way. Empty out your words, yes, pray to the Lord. But spend time in silence groaning. And you will hear the Holy Spirit speak. Give it time, I promise you will. You know what's interesting? Um, you know, yesterday, I, reading this, you're like, oh, yes, I should be groaning. So I was doing some groaning during some personal prayer. Oh, Lord. Oh, oh, you know, groaning. Holy Spirit, speak. I'm upset about these things going on. I'm, I'm, I'm frustrated. And you know... You know what the Holy Spirit, can you imagine what he said to me? You won't believe what the Holy Spirit spoke to me after my groanings. And it was as clear as anything. He told me I was prideful. <laughs> You're being prideful. I'm like, that's not what I need from you right now. Can you imagine? Because the Holy Spirit wants me to understand that no outward circumstance should be able to change the inward joy that I have with the Holy Spirit. And when it does, it's something wrong with me. 
not something wrong with an outward circumstance, something wrong with my own heart, my own mind. He goes on, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called to, according to his purpose. This will be our last verse today. I, I had intended in getting through the, the whole chapter, but Romans is very difficult to get through. Quickly, I promise, I hope, I better not promise. Let me not say anything because my yes should be yes and my no should be no. I want to get through it quicker, quicker over the next few months. But anyways, the, the prerequisite, the condition of this is for those who love him. It's not all things are going to work together for good for those who hate him, for those who are desiring their own will. And what's interesting is this portion of scripture, and as we get into Romans 9 and further, it's going to start comparing the sovereignty of God with man's free choice. Um, and both are clearly seen, and both are 100% accurate. We get, in last week's study, that he subjected hum, uh, creation to futility, not willingly, but in hope. So God, in his sovereignty, subjected in the Garden of Eden to Adam and Eve, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and then Satan to tempt them, so that they would have a choice either to love God or not love God and disobey him. They had to have it in order to have a loving relationship with God. You can't just have one choice and make it love. And, and so we see that God's not willing that any should perish. It wasn't God's will that Adam and Eve uh, perish and that an atom bomb blow up in the Garden of Eden and kill every one of us with him. That wasn't God's will. And I reject anybody who says it is. But God's still sovereign. He still has hope because he's in control of his ability to, to come down and die and to uh, uh, get a people into himself whom he has chosen. So we'll, we'll, get, through, we'll, we'll get through all that, but the idea here of, of all things working to good, you must love him for that to happen. There is a both and. And we're going to be comforted. Um, I'll be gone next Sunday because I'm, I'm, I'm leaving the country just for a week. And I'll be back. But the following one, we're going to come back to resting in God's ability. And the scripture is going to encourage us to do that. Resting in God's sovereignty. Resting in God's ability to make sure we're taken care of. We'll be encouraged by that. But understand that he works for those who are called according to his purpose, who love him, all good things. Think about Joseph. He is hated by his brothers. That, that right there is painful enough. You don't need to throw me in pit and try to kill me. I've already gone through terrible pain if my brothers hate me. But he does get thrown in a pit after that hatred. And they want to kill him. And then they're like, no, we shouldn't kill him. It'd be better off if we sold and we could make some money. The businessmen of the group, you know. Then he goes into slavery, into Potiphar's house, and he keeps loving God. He's not mad at God. It's not God's fault that his brothers hate him and wanted to kill him and sold him in slavery. It's his brother's fault. And we need to stop blaming, blaming God for all the bad things in the world and start blaming humanity. And, and, and so he's there and he's loving God and he's exalted in Potiphar's house. And his wife tries to sleep with him. You know, most men probably would be like, you know what, I deserve this. I've really suffered. I... I, I, I I deserve this. You know, there's no hope for a wife for me. I know this is wrong, God, but you know what I've gone through. No, Joseph doesn't do that. He's a man of God. He loves God. He says, I can't do this. I can't sin against God. Oh, isn't Joseph one of our favorite guys in the Bible, guys? Yeah. And ladies, don't you judge us. Just leave and, and, and he runs out, and for honoring God, he's thrown into prison.
prison. Because he loves God, he's thrown into prison. Do you think Joseph, if he had Romans 8, was reading and be like, hey, that ain't true. I love God and I'm in prison. And, and, and guess what? Joseph's outward circumstance did not determine his inward joy. Because guys are having nightmares and he's concerned for them. He's like, hey guys, you having trouble sleeping? <laughs> you having a nightmare? Oh man, can I pray for you? What can I do? Can you imagine a guy having an attitude like that? Can you imagine after all he's gone through, he still has the joy of the Lord as his strength? He's an amazing guy who serves an amazing God. So they tell him his dreams, it's interpreted. And guess what? He's like, hey, uh, don't want to overstep here. But when you go tell Pharaoh about the accuracy of these dreams because my God is uh, the God of the universe, can you just tell him about me? I don't deserve to be here. I told the truth. I am unlawfully in prison. Please help. What happens? They forget about him. Eddie spends two more years in prison. He gets out to a dream. And all things work for the good. He is exalted to the prime minister of the greatest empire in the world at that time. And even better than that, he gets a wife. He's like, hey, uh, can you imagine everything solidifying in one day for him? In one day, he's out of prison. He's set free. He's made prime minister, which gives him the second amount of power, which comes with tons and tons of money. And if that were not best, he's like, and by the way, Joseph, she's yours. And Joseph's like, oh. <laughs> His day couldn't get any better. This is a wonderful day. Which, by the way, I'm going to start going back to arrange marriages if you guys don't do your job quicker. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go up to these guys and be like, hey, she's yours. She may not agree, but <laughs> that's okay. I'm joking. Talking about all things working for the good, but Joseph loved him every step of the way. Every step of the way. Guys, God will turn your trials and your pain into good things if you love him through the process. You guys know that you almost poison yourselves every single day of your life with a chemical compound called sodium and a chemical compound called chlorine. If you just take sodium, you'll die. If you just take chlorine, you're dying. But if you put them together with a perfect mixture, you get table salt. You can take two very deadly things, put them together, and they become a very delicious thing. You, God can take all the pain, all the trials, all the heartache, all the suffering that apart... These things will destroy you. But when God puts them together in his heavenly chemistry lab, he can make wonderful things come out of it for your life. Embrace the pain. Ask God through groanings in the spirit what he's trying to teach you through it. I told somebody on Friday, one of our pastors here, him and his wife lost a child to a miscarriage recently. They're still suffering. The pain is still there. And I told him, ask God what he's trying to teach you. Ask God what he's wanting to accomplish through the pain you're going through right now. Don't turn away from God. As the worship team comes up, I would encourage you, take all the trials all the suffering. God knows your weaknesses. He's given you the Holy Spirit to intercede on your behalf. Ask, 
take all of these things and allow God to put them together so he can show you the beautiful thing he's trying to accomplish for his glory in your personal life. Amen? Let's bow our heads in prayer, please. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the privileges we have to be in it. We thank you for the encouragement, Lord, that in our weakness, you're not condemning us. You're not pointing at all the failures, but rather you are strengthening us. You are forgiving us and you are cleansing us. And then you make wonderful things come out of the trials that we go through, the pain that we go through. I want to, as everybody's heads bowed, I, I want to ask anybody in this room, in just a moment, I'll have you raise your hand to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Maybe there's somebody here who's not walking with the Lord. You're backslidden. You don't know if you would die today that you'd go to heaven. Jesus Christ has made an offer that if you confess him with your mouth and believe in your heart that he is the Christ and that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Don't leave here without confessing Christ. Don't leave here today without me praying for you. As we're all in prayer as a church, for those who want to receive Christ as their Lord and Savior, those who may have believed in Christ, but they're backslidden, I want you to raise your hand right now and I'm going to pray for you before you leave today. Thank you. Raise your hand. Receive the Lord Jesus Christ. Anyone else? Yes. 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 And please keep your hands raised so I can see you. I want to pray for you. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray for each person right now who are raising their hand. Oh, bless them, Lord. You know exactly what they're do going through. You know exactly what's happening in their life. You know every hair on their head. And I pray by your Holy Spirit, you would come into their hearts now and regenerate their spirits, creating in them a new creation in Christ Jesus for good works. Please bless them. I pray, Lord, that they would believe in the cross of Jesus Christ, which is the punishment for their sins, and that you would raise them into a new life. And I pray this for each person raising their hand right now, and I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Keep your hands raised, please. Lift them up high. Everybody, we have tons of people here raising their hands. God bless you.